That's right. Let's praise the Lord again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. 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 Praise God. And you may be seated. Hallelujah. Well, I tell you, the reason why I hadn't played until tonight, you see, uh, Sister Ewing took piano from me. Really? She was about 10 years of age. I was teaching in staff school of music. She so had so far surpassed me that I didn't want to play while she was here. <laughs> All right. Hallelujah. Let's praise the Lord with a good hand. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God, praise God, praise God. My wife says she can always tell kind of what kind of a mood I'm in by what I'm playing, and uh, so she declares that one day when she was going to go visit her folks for a week and she was in the bedroom packing up that all that morning I played This Is Like Heaven to Me. <laughs> Not really. Not really. Praise God. So you're not going to shout about this message tonight. I don't think. But to me, it's probably the most important message that I will preach. So out of the book of Genesis, the 24th chapter, if you want to stand again, praise God. 24th chapter, Genesis 24. I'm not going to read all of the verses. Let me just kind of paraphrase. There's, there's at least two verses that I want to impress upon your mind. But beginning at the first verse of chapter 24, Abraham is old. And the scripture said that he is well stricken in age. In other words, he's about to die. Now, God had made a covenant with Abraham, an all-important covenant. Be faithful to me, and I will give you a good land, and will make of you and your descendants a mighty people. But he didn't have, a, he didn't have any grandchildren, because Isaac wasn't married. And how was there going to be a, a going on of these generations and inheritances if Isaac didn't have a wife? So he called in his trusted servant, and he said, I want you to go back to the land, because Isaac cannot marry one of the daughters of the Canaanites. So you've got to go back to my country, to my kindred, and find a wife for my son Isaac. You know the story well. And the servant said, uh, and I'm still a bit paraphrasing, what if this woman doesn't want to come? What if I find one, but she doesn't want to come? Must I needs, listen to this, bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? And Abraham said unto him, Beware. And I want you to hear this. He not only says it once, but he says it twice. Beware thou that thou bring not my son thither again. Well, the conversation goes on, and then in the eighth verse, the eighth verse concludes by saying, Only Bring not my son thither again. You must not take Isaac back. And it echoes today, and my message, you must not go back. Yes. Amen. Amen. You must not go back. Shall we pray? In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. And you may be seated, but please pray. Would you pray for me? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Twice, Abraham tells his trusted servant, 
in so many words, whatever you do, even if she won't come with you, don't take my son back where I came from. Now, there's a reason why. You see, Abraham was from Haran. Now, Haran was a lively and lusty town. It was a far cry from the desert land where Isaac was born and raised. It was a center of the worship of the moon goddess. It was a carnival of sensualism. It was a commercial center of all trades. And Haran would have been an eye-opener for Isaac, who had never been away from the desert. Now, friend, as far as the world is concerned, I'm saying this, as far as the world is concerned, and the carnality of the world, we have been born and reared in the desert. All right. All right. Praise God. Follow me now. Amen. Abraham remembered when he left Haran. Oh, he didn't question God. But it had not been easy to wrench himself away from all the excitement of that place. It was exciting. And he feared, and hear me, his fear was that if Isaac were to ever go back, he might succumb to the spell of the bright lights and the sensualism and the worship of the moon goddess. And he wouldn't want to go back to the desert. And the inheritance, the covenant, would be endangered. The divine call would be reversed. God called Abraham out. Amen. Amen. And so if Isaac went back and decided to stay, the covenant would have been jeopardized. If he went back and wanted to stay where the bright lights were. Now say what you will. There is a powerful pull of the past. Amen. Amen. If that were not true, this auditorium, your church buildings, would not contain the crowds. Many have already gone back. Backsliders. Amen. There is a powerful pull of the past. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. You must not go back. There are some laws that are not legislative laws. They are not on the books in the courthouse or in the county or in the government. You know them well. There's the law of the harvest. You reap what you sow. There is the law of gravity. Everything that goes up is going to come down. And there's the law of centrifugal force. We used to try that out when we were kids. We'd put a, a water in a bucket and sling it over our heads, you know, and get going fast enough. And even though it was right over our heads, the water wouldn't come out because the centrifugal force, we just didn't stop with it overhead. That's the law of centrifugal force. Now, there's another law that uh, you don't hear so much about, but it is similar in the respect that it is not a legislative law. It is the law called the principle of reversion to type. The law called the principle of reversion to type. Everything that is improved, if it is left on its own, will go back to its original state. 
Amen? Those large, luscious strawberries that we find in those big strawberry pies. I'm going to make you hungry now, but the restaurants will be closed. Maybe. Those large, luscious strawberries. You know, they had their beginning in the wild, little tiny strawberries of the woods, but they have been vastly improved. Those beautiful hybrid roses can be dated back to the primitive dog rose of the hedges. A lot of our domesticated animals that are so useful to us today were derived from some of the wild ones of the forest. In our home in Nashville, Tennessee, prior to going back to St. Louis, I had some professional landscaping done. I'm not an outdoorsman and not much good in the yard, and I had one particular place that I needed uh, a particular something that would be a little bit outstanding, and so the nursery people uh, decided that the best thing that would go in that corner was a tree rose or a rose tree. Now that's a long stem, a long trunk without anything on it from the ground up to the top, and then it balls out into a beautiful ball of leaves and the most beautiful roses that you've ne nearly ever seen. And it was, it was attractive. It was beautiful. But one cold winter, I failed to protect it. And in the coldness of the freezing, frigid temperature, it froze from the ground up. So the easiest thing for me to do was to get a saw and just saw it off even with the ground. I just didn't even bother to dig it up. But in the spring... When the springtime came, out from that root that had been left in the ground was a rambling vine that just ran across the ground. It didn't even raise up an inch or two. It had reverted back to its original state, the principle of reversion to type. Now, there's a lot of things going on today, but one of the greatest tragedies of today is neglect. If you neglect a garden plant, a natural principle of deterioration comes in and changes that into a worse plant. You ladies know that when you clean your house ever so good and leave it for a day or two, you come back to dust and cobwebs. Where they came from, you just don't know, but it's the law of reversion to type. The same thing can happen to you and me. Amen. It runs throughout all of creation. If a man neglects himself in the natural, in the few years he will be changed to a worse man. If he neglects the body, it's going to deteriorate into a worse body. Neglect the mind and it will degenerate into madness. If you neglect your conscience, it will run off into lawlessness and vice. And when you neglect the soul, it will drop off into ruin and decay. One of the greatest scriptures that I can point you to tonight that tells you what I'm trying to say is Proverbs when he says, I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all overgrown with thorns and nettles that covered the face thereof and the stone wall thereof was broken down then I saw and considered it well. Here's a man that had every opportunity to have one of the greatest vineyards. He not only neglected the vines, he neglected the walls. And Proverbs said, when I saw it, I considered it well. I'm telling you, you better listen to me tonight, and you better see some things, and you better consider them well, because there are some things that's reverting to type. God speaks to Isaiah uh, in Isaiah the fifth chapter of cultivating and planting of the choicest vine. I'm not going to take the time to read it, Isaiah 5, 2 to 7. And then what a warning in Romans the 11th chapter in the 21st verse, for if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold the goodness and severity of God on them which fail severity, but toward thee goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. Yeah, yes, sir. My God, my God. 
there are fish tonight in the darkened mammoth cave in Kentucky that have eyes, but they are but mere specks that see nothing. The front of those eyes are perfect. Behind those eyes is a mass of ruined optic nerves that have been shrunken. Because they are in total darkness, God says you don't need your eyes, so he took their eyes away from them. Moles spend their time beneath the surface of the ground tearing up your beautiful lawns, and nature says if they mean to live in darkness, they don't need their eyes, so she closes them up. Now, we have some spiritual senses. The sense of sight spiritually. Neglect this, leave it undeveloped, and you simply see nothing. But cultivate it, develop it, improve it, and don't neglect it, and you will see God, see God, see God, see God more and more and more. There is the sense of spiritual sound. Amen. Hearing, hearing the voice of the Lord. You can get your ear so in tune with heaven until you will develop such a constancy, constancy with Him that when He speaks, you will hear His voice. But neglect it, it will revert back to its original state and you won't hear anything. Amen. Amen. Develop your sense of touch. Amen. Reach out and touch the Lord as He is passing by. And you can feel Him when He passes by. Some of you already have neglected your sense of sight and your sense of hearing and your sense of touch until He's already been here in so many ways and you haven't felt Him, you haven't heard Him, you haven't seen Him, you haven't touched Him. Amen. And there's a sense of taste. Well, what has taste got to do with it? A lot. Amen. There's a spiritual hunger after God. Amen. And the scripture said, taste and see. You've got to develop a hunger. One of the reasons why the crowd is not here in the morning like it ought to be is because there is a lack of... And pardon me, I'm plain. I'm glad I played tonight. Amen. There is a lack of hunger. You better develop that taste. We're headed into darkness. And if you neglect the taste for the Word of God, I heard of a prayer meeting one time that was so great and so anointed that when they were finished praying, they all sat around smacking their lips. It tasted so good. Doesn't the Scripture say it tastes like honey? Woo! It tastes like honey in the rock. Amen. And one day you had a taste, and one day you had sight, and one day you had ears. But you have let it revert back. Because the law of reversion to type stops the ears, the eyes, and the taste, and the feel. Amen. And from that beautiful tree rose, a little rambling vine, from the luscious strawberries, the tiny, primitive strawberry. W. A. Criswell is called a Baptist legend. And he has been a real proponent for the inerrancy of the Word of God. He said, and I quote, the Southern Baptist Convention is declining. And this is what he says. I don't think we will ever split I think we will erode. I think we will gradually acquiesce. Gradually acquiesce. Just gradually give up. Amen. We've got some people that are just gradually eroding. 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 
The book called The Pentecostals, written by Walter J. Holland Wigger, says the women of the United Pentecostal Church practically stand alone today as church after church falls into the peril of the painted face. And he said this, the relaxation of rigorism, which can be observed in most of the larger Pentecostal denominations, the relaxation of it, is the reason why every 20 years a new Pentecostal denomination has to be formed. The older churches become more reasonable, abandon taboos and enthusiastic practices. Senator Luger from Indiana, former uh, head of the Foreign Relations Committee, said to Brother Urshan, if the United Pentecostal Church ever goes back on its standard of holiness, we will lose our last bulwark of holiness in these United States. What an indictment. What an indictment. Amen. Hey, I'm going to show you tonight what I'm talking about. Some of you folks are too young to remember a movie star by the name of Ingrid Bergman. She died recently, but it goes back 35 or 40 years ago. Just prior to her death, she was asked to play the part of, of Golda Meir in a movie. Golda Meir was the Prime Minister of Israel. And Ingrid Bergman had had a controversial affair with the Italian movie producer Roberta Rossellini. Amen. And when that happened, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you facts. When that happened, and kept in the Congressional Record, March 14, 1950, Senator Edwin C. Johnson of Colorado took the floor of the United States Senate to denounce Bergman and Rossellini. He called Ingrid one of the most powerful women on earth today, I regret to say, a powerful influence for evil. That's in the Congressional Record. But after she made uh, the movie, a few years ago, prior to her death, she said, and I quote, The fact that I had a child with someone I wasn't married to wouldn't have made a scandal today. She said, and listen to this, it's hard to find anything that would. She said, it's really amazing, isn't it, how things have changed. Not changed, but reverted to type. Mmm, mmm. Mm, mm. My God, my God, my God, my God, my God, my God. Amen, amen, amen. Reverted to type, reverted to type. A famous woman comedian, not connected with Ingrid Bergman, but she too has just recently passed away, Lucille Ball, when they made this statement. I'm shocked because I am not shocked. I am shocked because I am not shocked. Hey, that's reverting back, reverting back. It was in the year of 1963, General Conference in Memphis, Tennessee, one of the very rare occasions that we had a woman preacher preach in a night service. We've had a few, but not many. This was a very prominent night service, and this famous woman evangelist preached, and I never have forgotten. The title of her message was The Pentecostal Wailing Wall. The Pentecostal Wailing Wall. Ah, how she she said some things on this wise, the glory of the first church. And the thing that made them so powerful and so different was separation from the world, modesty and holiness. Then she said, and this is the way she said it, Yeah, I'm going to do some harping. I didn't say that. She said it. God's people have always been peculiar, always been separated. God's people have always looked different have always acted different, and have always talked different, and, and they've always been different. And then she said, we are so mealy-mouthed and so scared silly to offend that we cannot call sin by its right name. I wish I could tell you tonight that she still believes that. But she called me the other day. She was in St. Louis. We've been long-time friends. 
for my wife and I. And she said, you know, that that's going to be good. I said, wow. Pentecostal flavor. Have you forgotten it? Oh, my, my, my. We've always been different. Amen. Amen. In 1971, in the Houston Conference, and incidentally, I have not missed a single conference since 1945. The merger. Not one. I'm not even going to knock on wood because I'm not so busy. Amen. But in 1971, an outstanding minister stood and preached one night and held a spell bound. And he made this statement. All of you people who believe in three gods, he named the organization, the Trinitarian, he called them by name, they're just with their arms wide open waiting for you. Today, he lets them preach in his pulpit. You must not go back. Dear God. The little boy and his dad was out flying a kite. And the little boy said to his dad, Dad, what's holding the kite up? The dad said, Son, it's the string. And the boy said, No, Dad, that's holding it down. And the dad took out his knife and cut the string. And the kite went up and then spiraled down and crashed. What's holding it up, us up? It's the string. And everybody wants to cut the string. They're spiraling up for a little while, but... One day, they're going to come crashing down. In the Houston Chronicle, Church of God relaxes rules, okay, he's wearing makeup jewelry. The Church of God has relaxed its century-old holiness code so members can wear makeup and jewelry if they remain modest. Delegates to the Church of God General Assembly Convention, which wrapped up Monday, voted to amend the general rules of modesty to reflect growth and change. Warnings against immoral entertainment are in the new code, but there is no ban against members attending movies, dances, or other ungodly amusements. The church also will no longer tell members to adhere to the scriptural admonition that our women have long hair and our men have short hair. Are we headed that direction? Oh, God! Oh, God! My God! My God! My God! My God! Let me tell you this. This is a former Bible school teacher in one of our Bible schools. A farmer. I underline farmer. He's no longer. This article, this is his article, written by him. He said, uh, I remember standing outside the building which contained my office, and he named the school, the, our Bible school, where he was, explaining to one of my colleagues how deeply distressed I was I have reached the conclusion that the new issue of 1914-16 was one of the most disastrous and mistaken theological directions ever taken. And then he said, I am not willing to consign to Hades 99% of all Christians ever born just because they did not speak in tongues or have a magical set of words called out over them in the baptismal pool. A magical set of words. That's Jesus' name. That's what he's talking about. He's referring to it as a magical set of words. Hey, he's reverted to type. What he was delivered from, he has apparently gone back to. My God, I shudder. I shudder when I think of what all is happening. And when you start going back, there's no stopping. You know, I pastored for 14 years in Nashville, Tennessee. And, you know, Nashville, Tennessee is... Uh, is this all right? Well, well, if it isn't, it's all right with me. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Because I'm, I'm shuddering within my very soul when I see some of the trends. Oh, God, the thing that has made the church powerful is separation. We act different. We look different. We are different. We talk different. Amen. We're always going to be different. Mm. 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 Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Nashville. It's the home of country western music. It's the home of the Grand Ole Opry. It's the home of Minnie Pearl. It's the home now of 
gospel music. It's the home. I'm telling you. Nashville is the home of a lot of things. And frequently we see some of those uh, prominent Christians. We were sitting in a little restaurant the other day when Mrs. Cannon was just at the next table with us. Mrs. Cannon is Minnie Pearl. And so we talked with Mrs. Cannon and our grandchildren had their pictures made with Mrs. Cannon, whatever that meant. But anyway, we see them. One of them, one day my wife and I was uh, on a plane uh, getting ready to go, I guess, preach a camp meeting. The next plane to our had mechanical difficulties, so all of the passengers on that plane could be transferred to our plane because they could make connections in the city where our plane was going to stop. And we were already boarded and ready to go, and lo and behold, in walked Ollie Parton. He had to come back to the coach section because they weren't in, wasn't in room for it in the first place. And I said to my wife, I said, hey, do you have a track? And she always has whatever I need. <laughs> I also had in my Bible, which was very close at hand, uh, a portion of Dolly Parton's biography. So I took that track after we got airborne and I went back to where she was seated and I said, uh, Dolly, gave her my card. You know, she's the one that had the big wig. I said, I, I happen to have a portion of your biography here. I, I'd like for you to autograph this for me. Now, I don't care about autographs, but you know. And uh, so she said, well, uh, if you will leave it with me and let me look at it, I'll, I'll be glad to do it. Well, she looked at it, and, and this is uh, this is what she had to read before she signed it. You know, it has a Pentecostal background, not oneness, but... And this is what the biography says. Although the Partons were very poor, they were a secure and loving family. My daddy is what you call dyed in the wool country, Dolly says fondly. He didn't believe women could cut their hair or wear trousers. He never let any of his children go on dates. He didn't like me to wear makeup, so I put mature chrome on my lips instead. He was sad as his children grew up and went away. When I was a little girl, going to the movies were, was considered sinful in our neck of the woods, he continued. But when a movie called Thunder Road, a true Tennessee story that was filmed right near us, and scarred Robert Mitchum came to town. Daddy said we could go. I was tickled to death, of course, but it also made me feel sad to be there. I didn't enjoy the movie. Up until that night, Mama and Daddy were my heroes, and it seemed as though they'd broken their own rules. Even though that meant I got to see the movie, I wish they hadn't. Mm. Yeah, pastor, preacher, you want to give up a little bit? And when they do it, they're going to wish you hadn't. They're going to wish you had me. Amen. She signed her name right under a scripture that I had written above her biography. For I, if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. She had to read that too. Hey, what's happening? Are we so allured by what's going on, the flamboyance, and all the glitter out there to think that Hey, we need to go down, go down, go down. No, never, never. When we go back, we are reverting back to the things we have been delivered from. I was standing in our kitchen one morning, and, and you, you probably have heard this statement because I, I have said it. It's worth repeating. Others have said it. But we have in St. Louis KMOX, and every morning about 7 o'clock, we have Richard Evans' thought for the day. And I wasn't paying any attention that morning. I just liked some little background, easy music or something. And I wasn't paying much attention. But all of a sudden, Richard Evans came on. With, and he's not a minister. He's, he's just a philosopher. And his opening remarks that morning grabbed my attention. He said, don't ever take a fence down until you know the reason it was put up. Mm. My God, I know you've heard it, because I've just said it everywhere, and others have said it too. Amen. But Richard Evans was the one that, that coined it. He said, don't ever take a fence down until you know the reason it was put up. Too many people in too many places tend to remove time-honored safeguards, the reasons for which they do not know. Mm. Mm. There are some foundations that are firmly fixed, if not, there is nothing that anyone can measure by or count on except his own preference, his own mood of the moment, and that, of course, is chaos. There are some foundational principles, 
some standards, some basic qualities of character without which there is no progress, no assurance, without which no society or no person is safe. Hmm. Oh, my God. My God. Hey, if you are thinking about letting up, going back, yeah, the bright lights of Haran are going to entice you. And as far as you're concerned, the covenant will be lost. Don't take him back. Whatever you do, swear to me, servant, that you will not take Isaac back. And folks, you better not go back. Oh, I preached too long, man. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Hey, folks. We need a revival of backsliders. But what if they come back to God and they see you doing what they backslid over. There are hundreds, yea, thousands, and perhaps, yea, many thousands of people that through the years backslid over cutting their hair. What if they come back and want to pray through what they see being allowed but they backslid over. Many of them backslid because they wanted to put a little paint on their face. Amen. Earrings, other things. What if when they come back, they see that now it's all right to do these things? You talk about total confusion. Hey, what have we been saved from anyway? Are we going back to the vomit? Are we going back to the wallow? God saved us from the world. My God, my God, my God, my God, my God, my God. Whoa, oh, 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 oh. Say, stand with me, everybody. Amen. In the early days of the 1900s, they didn't think of them as laws and rules and barriers. They thought, my God, I want to get so close to you that I'm not going to do this. And I want to get so close to you that I'm not going to do this. And I'm going to get so close to you. I want to get so close to you that this is off limits. I'm not going to do this. And they laid those things aside. They gave them up. And what we have called barriers and legalism now was precious truth back then that they gave up because they wanted to get so close to God. Oh, friend, I want to get close to God. Oh, go back. The law of reversion to type is just as certain as the law of gravity. When you start back, For I, the Lord, speak unto you this night. You have not seen near all of my glory. I have not worked in and among you as much as I would like to work. But I am looking for vessels that I can move through and work through that are totally committed and that love me with all of their hearts. 
I will do a great work in these last days through only those who will separate themselves unto me and give themselves totally committed unto my hand. For even this night, standing in and among you are those who are hungry to see my glory. Where will they see it? Can they see it in you in the loose way that you've lived? They are hungry to see my glory. Can they find it in a gathering like this where their minds are so divided that they cannot give themselves to me totally? Oh, I say unto thee, what I will do even this night is beyond your comprehension. If you will give yourself completely to the move of my spirit, my glory cloud will descend upon you and ye shall feel the drippings of the sanctuary upon you even now. Hey, plenty of room, plenty of room. Don't go back. Come forward. Find yourself a place. Satan is tempting every one of us to get the easy road, the easy road. Amen. Take the easy road. Take the easy road. Oh, my God, my God, my God. Bring somebody with you. Hey, backslider, there are those of us who are still preaching against the things that you backslid over. I promise you that we still hold to those things. And you backslid over them. You come and pray through. We will love you. We will help you. We really will. Don't get your eyes upon those who have sought for and are going a lesser route. There is a straight and narrow... Find a place to pray. Hey, there's a tremendous move of God. He wants to show us His glory tonight. But He's not going to just show it whimsically against those things that are so worldly. He's going to show it to those who are hid in the cleft of the rock. Come on, come on. Everybody ought to pray tonight. If you don't want to come down here, pray where you are. Kneel somewhere. And if you have thought about going back, I'm here to tell you, you are headed for trouble. Hey! 